Amen. I believe we're free today. Can somebody give me a shout? Uh, we are free in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, I invite you to stand to your feet as we go to the Word of God this morning. And I'm directing my attention to the 33rd chapter of the book of Psalms. It is the 33rd Psalm that David wrote. And there's one verse, I'm going to be very brief in my comments this morning, but there's one verse to which your attention needs to be directed this morning, and that is the 12th verse of the 33rd Psalm. Psalm chapter number 33 and verse number 12. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 33 and verse number 12. If you have it, say amen. The Bible said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Two segments to that verse, notice that he said, first of all, the nation who makes God their Lord is blessed. But then in the midst of that nation is a select group of people who he has chosen for his own inheritance, which tells me that within the United States of America, there is a select group of people that have been chosen by God as the inheritance because we are the chosen people of the living God. Can somebody shout amen? And so as the nation goes, it depends upon those, you and I, who have been chosen by God as his inheritance. Amen? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You saw as you walked in the lobby that there were some displays set up, and I want you, if you did not yet, to get a chance to stop by and take a look at those. There will be some books available as well to be given to you. Those are free of charge about prayers for our nation and about our country, and you are free to take those. Also, the youth conference table is still up in the lobby, and I invite you to stop by that as well and see the next-gen ministry and support those young people. But today, my attention is directed to the United States of America because tomorrow is Independence Day. And I realize many of you have uh, family outings. You're going to take your family to the lake, maybe grill out some steaks or some uh, hamburgers or swim. I don't know what you're going to do. And I enjoy those times with my family, and I'm looking forward to that as well. And got a little son yesterday. Felt good to be outside. But in the midst of all of the celebration that we're going to have tomorrow I never want to forget how blessed we are to live in the United States of America. Amen. And I understand, I, I understand that we as a nation are not perfect, and, but let's be honest, there is no perfect nation on the face of this planet. And I also know that throughout the history of our country, there have been many dark seasons within the United States history of things about which we are ashamed and should have never happened. I totally understand that we have many flaws and we are not perfect, but even the chosen people of God, the Israelites, amen, throughout Scripture, you see them go through seasons of doubt and seasons of idolatry and seasons of lack of faith and rebellion and disobedience. Obedience. In fact, there was one time when Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law of God, having a face-to-face -face encounter with Jehovah. The Israelites were at the base of the mountain, amen, dancing around naked around a golden calf. And the assistant pastor, Aaron, was just saying, I don't know what to do with these crazy people. And God's got so aggravated with them that he came to Moses in Deuteronomy 9. He said, I've seen this people. They're stiff necked He said, let me alone. I want to destroy them. I want to blot their name out of heaven. And Moses, how many, how many know sometimes God gets aggravated with his kids? He does. I mean, I, I can only imagine how God looks at us sometimes and says, man, after all that I've done for you, but Moses begins to intercede and God changes his mind and does not blot them out. Let me tell you something. I, the reason I say that is because I know sometimes when we look at America and we see all of the idolatry and we see all of the sensuality and we see all of the wickedness and we see all of the darkness that is pervading our country. And at times it almost seems like, you know, we're beyond hope, we're beyond help, we're beyond restoration, we're beyond reach, we're beyond revival. But I really believe like Moses, we as the people of God, how many know we can intercede on behalf of our country and God may change his mind about America? How many believe that? Shout amen. Amen. 
Because in spite of God wanting to destroy Israel, they are still the chosen people of God. Romans 11, Paul said, I, I say, has God cast away his people? No, God forbid. He said, I'm an Israelite. I'm the seed of Abraham. And it's crucial that you and I understand that when God places his hand upon a nation, no matter how far that nation may stray, no matter how dark that nation may become, God always has a chosen remnant. God always has a people. God always has an Elijah that will come and stand in front of the nation and say, hey, it's time for you to make a choice. And church, you know what? I realize that I'm not perfect, but I just feel like I have a message. I really believe God wants some Elijahs in America today, right now to lift up their voice and to say, it does not have to be this way. And I know some of you may fall out with me on this, but I'm going to preach it anyway because I feel it deeply within my heart. Brother, why do we, why, why, why are we complaining about the condition of our country when God's given us the power and the authority to do something about it and stand as the chosen people of God and have a voice and say, we can make a difference. Come on, somebody. Do you hear me now? Shout amen. Glory to God. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But it's very easy to look around and see the spirit of lawlessness and, 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 and realize that yes, the devil is having uh, his way within our country. And, and I, I, I look at what's going on in the entertainment industry and I look at what's going on in, in politics and I go to the gas pump and, you know, paying five bucks a gallon for gas. And I, I look at everything that's going on and it's easy for us to hang our head and we, we, we wonder, Lord, is there anything that I can do? But let me tell you what God said through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Amen. Something powerful happens when a man has hope. How many believe that? And I just want to tell you, I still got hope. Amen. My hope, amen, does not rest in the White House. My hope does not rest in the State House. My hope does not rest in a congressman or a congresswoman. Amen. My hope does not rest even in America. My hope rests in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And as long as there is breath in my lungs, I'm going to preach the glory glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and motivate a church to get off our tail end and realize who we are as the blood-bought church of the Lord Jesus Christ and realize we are the lighthouse to this world. Somebody shout amen. Glory to God. No matter how bad things get in our nation, there is a hope that God wants his people to possess about our country. I love what Paul wrote about uh, Paul and or Paul wrote about uh, Abraham in Romans chapter 4. He said who against hope, he believed in hope uh, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which is spoken uh, and so shall thy seed be. I love the songwriter who so eloquently wrote that my hope uh, is built on nothing less but Jesus blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. How many are glad? We've got a foundation in Jesus today, amen. Without God, America has no hope. I don't care if it's a Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian, Green Party, or whoever, Orange Party, whoever's sitting in the White House, Outside of God, we don't have hope. Without God, America's done. We're doomed. We're destroyed. But with God, I said with God, there can and there will be hope for a divine turnaround in our nation. We've begun to see even last week with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, further protecting the lives of the unborn. Amen. 50 years of prayer that went in. Amen. Let me tell you something. God is still moving. Come on, somebody. He's still moving. And that's why the psalmist could say, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance. 
Now, I'm not here just to pump you up or make you feel good. I want to show you why we have hope, why we stand in the face of seemingly incredible opposition and still have hope that God is moving in our country. Number one, we have hope because of where we have been. Because of where we have been. The psalmist said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, I understand there's a lot of revisionists that are trying to rewrite the history of the United States, and they're going into the history books of uh, classrooms and, 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 and rewriting the history and taking God out of the history uh, of the United States. But I'm going to just tell you, uh, you can't change what has happened. And our nation was founded on a foundation that is based upon this book, which is uh, the word of Almighty God. Amen. You can, you can, you can like it. You can lump it. You can disagree with it, but it is a fact. It is a fact. On July 4, 1776, in Philadelphia, our founding fathers signed a document declaring our independence from the tyranny of those who would enslave the minds, souls, and lives of men. But what we don't realize is that the same document not only declared our independence from Great Britain, but also our dependence upon Almighty God. Same document. Declaration of Independence begins by proclaiming that we are subject, check this out, only to the laws of nature and nature's God. You know how the Declaration of Independence ends? It ends with these words, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. These men wrote these words on that sweltering day in Philadelphia saying that we are dependent only upon the provision of Almighty God. Our fathers did not believe in the separation of God from government, but rather they believed that this nation was founded by God, protected by God, preserved by God, and prospered by God. And because of that, of the 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence, nine of them died in the hardships of war, five captured, imprisoned, and subjected to torture. Several lost their wives, children, or their entire families. One lost all 13 of his children. Two wives were brutalized by the British. All were at one time uh, victims of manhunts and driven from their homes. Twelve had their homes completely burned. Seventeen lost everything they owned, but all of them did it because they believed upon the foundation in which they were building this country. Now, let me tell you something. Why do I tell you that? It's because of this. I understand we're living in a day right now that is trying to undo everything, amen, that this nation has been built on. They're trying to undo the morals. They're trying to undo the beliefs. They're trying to undo the patterns of behavior. They're trying to undo the ideology and the thought pattern. But I want to tell you something, church. I really believe it's time that we understand the only reason we are 246 years old and have the freedom that we do, it is not because of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, or Benjamin Franklin. It is because these men believed in the hand of an almighty God, and they were, they were escaping a religious persecution that said, amen, you can't worship God. No, we will worship God, and we will go to a place where we will build our families and our homes and our lives upon the first foundation of the word of God. That is the reason we are blessed. You take God out of America and not only we are not known, I now no longer one nation under God. We are simply one nation under. We need God in America because that's where we've been and that's where we're going to stay. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. I realize, listen, I realize the house may crumble. I realize it's being dismantled by leftist thinking and liberal theologians that are denying the validity of the word of God. I understand that politicians are trying to push, amen, a leftist agenda that are undermining, amen, the thought processes of the United States of America. Yes, piece by piece, the house may be dismantled, but as long as the foundation remains, you can tear the whole house down 
and you can rebuild it again. And brother, I'm telling you, under the divine unction of the Holy Ghost, that the foundation of America is secure because the foundation is in this book, which is the inspired word of Almighty God. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So why do I have hope in America? I have hope because of where we've been. I have hope, amen, because of what we were built upon. Amen. But number two, amen, the psalmist not only said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, but also the people that he has chosen for his inheritance. So number two, I've got hope in America because of who we are. Because of who we are. Let me explain it this way. Paul the Apostle said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Now, why did the Holy Ghost move upon the Apostle Paul to write the word ambassadors? What is an ambassador? In a political sense, I believe we all know what an ambassador is. It is an accredited individual that has been sanctioned by the president of a certain country to represent that country to a foreign land. They have an embassy in a foreign country, and that person has been sanctioned by the top by the by the head of the United States to represent the United States to wherever, Germany, China, wherever it might be. They now have the full authority of the president of the United States. So when that ambassador speaks, it is the same as if the president is also speaking. You understand what I'm saying? Their words have the same weight and the same authority as the president of the United States. And so Paul said, we are ambassadors for Christ, which means we have been, we have been authorized by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he has invested within us the full authority of the kingdom of heaven to represent the kingdom of heaven to a foreign land, which is the United States of America. Can I, do you all understand what I'm saying today? Now, let, 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 let me ask you this. Uh, how many sometimes when you look at around in our country, how many sometimes feel like you're living in a foreign country? I mean, even, I, I, again, I'm, I'm pretty young, aren't I? <laughs> it's a good spot for you to say amen. Just kidding. But, he, but, but, but this country is fundamentally different right now than it was even when I was a kid. I mean, there's, 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 there's junk going on now that I never imagined we would be facing in our country. But take that aside. From the spiritual standpoint, we come from a different kingdom we're serving the kingdom, an everlasting kingdom of heaven that is never going to go away. Amen. Amen. It is governed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is governed by the master of the universe. And Jesus, when he redeemed us, has invested within us his full authority. You know, Paul said this. He said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. In other words, you do not fit in. You are different. You are, Let me tell you something, church. Anytime the world can can't tell the difference between the world and the church, we have failed in our mission. I said, we have failed in our mission. He said, you are different than the world. He went on to say in the 11th verse, he said, dearly beloved, he said, I beseech you as a stranger and as a pilgrim. You're a stranger. You don't fit in. This world is strange, but you're also a pilgrim, meaning you are just passing through. How many are glad this world is not your home? Amen. I said, this world is not your home. I could preach on that for a long time. Amen. We've got a place called heaven that we're going to, listen, every ache and pain, amen, every joint that creaks when you get out of bed in the morning, every 
every headache is going to be gone. All the gray hair, no hair, whatever is going to be gone. Amen. You're going to be living in a place of divine perfection throughout all of eternity, shouting around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are strangers and we're pilgrims in this world. Amen. But while we are here, we are ambassadors. And church, this is what I want you to understand today. This is why I have hope. Uh, amen. Jesus said in Matthew 6, uh, when he taught us how to pray, he said, thy kingdom come. He said, thy will be done. Where? Check it out. Where? In earth uh, as it is in heaven. It is our job to bring, amen, the principles of the kingdom of heaven down to this earth as an ambassador. Amen. You have the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ living inside of you. So, brother, do not back down from that fella that says, amen, that he's got a right to do whatever. Let me tell you something. You've got the right as a child of God to stand on the word of God and say thus saith the Lord you can believe what you want but this is the inspired word of God you have the authority of almighty God living within you amen how do we bring that authority number one we get on our knees we get on our knees Paul told Timothy he said I exhort you therefore he said first of all everybody shout the word first not second, not third, not fourth. But he said, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks should be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. I want to tell you something, church. I really believe, and I will admit, I have failed many times. But I believe we would see more things happen in our country if the church would just get off Facebook and Twitter and stop complaining and stop Griping, and I understand there's a place from platform for a voice, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. But if we would spend more time on our knees than we do our iPhone, how many believe God would begin to move in the United States of America? If we would start talking more to God about America than we do to everybody else about how much we disagree with the president and the Congress and everybody else, because God is the only one that has the power to change anything, somebody shout amen. You say, Pastor, come on now, do you really believe that? Yes, I do, because the Bible says in Proverbs 21 and verse 1 that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever that he will. Now, you may, you, you may, you may look at me and say, well, Pastor, I, I don't agree with our president. I don't agree with our Congress. Doesn't matter if, doesn't matter if they're an ungodly outfit. God can still change their heart. How many believe it? Shout amen. I said, you don't hear what I'm saying. Cyrus was a Persian king, not a follower of God. He was a pagan, but yet God stirred up, 2 Chronicles 36, the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and said, thus saith the king, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he's charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Cyrus is a pagan king, doesn't follow God, but God inspired him. And he said, you know what? I'm going to build a house for God in Jerusalem. Amen. He doesn't know God. He's not saved. He's not a believer. But you know what? Amen. God can make even an unbeliever do his will when God's people get on their face and say, hey, we need revival. God can take a president, a king, and a congressman and change their heart. Amen. Glory to God. I believe our president can get saved, don't you? I only got about half of you on that. I said, I believe our president can get saved. I believe the Spirit of God can come in the White House and conviction can get that cabinet and something can happen. Come on, church, do we believe... 
I said, do we believe God or not? Paul said, pray for the king. Pray for the emperor. Amen. Pray. In that day, it was Nero. Nero was a blood thirsty, uh, godless individual. But Paul said, pray for him. Because I believe that as long as there's breath uh, in somebody's lungs, there is hope. Uh, and when God gets a hold of the heart of leaders, uh, amen, the heart of leaders can change uh, the heart of a nation. Amen. The future of America does not depend on the people on the state house, the courthouse, the Congress, the White House. I believe the future of America depends upon the church house. Second Chronicles 7 and 14, the Bible said, if my people, this is still the beacon of hope that this nation rests upon. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. And this is the best part. He said, I will heal their land. That is a word from God. Do you believe that? I'm asking you right now, and I've been guilty. I have not done it every day. I'm asking you right now to start praying every day for your president. I don't care if he's your party or not. doesn't matter. Start praying for your Congress. Start praying for your representative. Get a hold of the courts of heaven. I lost some of you on that, didn't I? I said, get a hold of the courts of heaven. You know why? And, 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 and I truly believe this, because the authority that is in you is more powerful than the authority that is in our president. I said the authority, and I'm not being rebellious when I say that. I mean that with all my heart. The authority that is in you is more powerful than the authority that is in the heart of the president because you have the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When are we going to stop walking around limp-wristed with our head down like we don't even know who we are when we've got the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ living within us? Jesus said, you're going to say to that mountain, be thou removed, and it will be it because of the authority that lies within you. You will lay hands on on the sick and what's going to happen. They will recover. Amen. You've got power over demons. You've got power over serpents and scorpions. Amen. You can drink deadly poison, not on purpose, of course. Amen. But you've got authority and it's not going to hurt you. Why? Because the authority in you is greater than the authority out there. So take that authority and pray for your leader. Somebody shout amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Unfortunately, the times are desperate, but the church is not. We need to cry out to God on behalf of our nation and its leadership. Get desperate before God. Not a little now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayer. Not a good food, good meat, good Lord, let's eat kind of prayer. Pray like the future of the nation depends on it. Because it does. Are y'all with me today? Amen. Get on our knees. But number two, get on our feet. Get on our feet. George Washington is credited with saying that government is a troublesome servant and a fearful master. There comes a time that we've got to get up on our feet and stand up for what we believe. There comes a time if the government commands what God condemns, you are obligated to have a voice. The midwives disobeyed Pharaoh's command to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. Daniel disobeyed King Darius and prayed to God anyway, even though he wasn't supposed to. The same Peter who wrote that we should submit to government's authority and respect the king is the same Peter who boldly told the religious leaders who told him to stop preaching about Jesus that we must obey God, Acts 5, rather than men. Christians in Asia Minor disobeyed the imperial edict to, edict to swear Caesar is Lord. They threw their incense to the ground in defiance and declared Christ is Lord. They were all blessed by God for the stand they took against the government and for the truth. Now, I am not, I am not in any way advocating civil disobedience, but what I am advocating is that we as a church need to get our head out of the sand and get up on our feet and pay attention to what is going on in our nation right now. Because if you don't stand up for your freedom, they are about to be taken right away from you and you're going to stick around and say, Hey, what just happened? I tell you what just happened. You were too busy worrying about 
about what so-and-so's doing on Facebook uh, and you didn't get on your feet and get on your knees uh, and realize you've got to take a stand for what is right. Come on, church. Somebody shout amen. Let me say this. We've got, we've got individuals in our church that are principals and teachers and bus drivers and educators in our public school, and they are godly, righteous men and women of God. And I want to tell you, men and women that are in our public school system, I honor you, and I feel we need to honor them right now today. Because you, I've heard from some of them. They've told me stories of what they go through every day, the, the, the stories of, of children coming and, and, and out of horrific situations and little five-year-olds dropping the F-bomb on the bus. And, you know, they don't even know what they're doing. These little kids, they have, they're have they being raised in a cesspool of unrighteousness. Amen. But I tell you that because parents, let me tell you, I really believe you need to get on your feet and get in the classroom and figure out what is happening in the classrooms of America and what is happening to the children of America and you need to step up and say, ah, uh-uh, no, no, no. My Johnny is not going to be taught uh, that he can be a boy or a girl. Depends on how he feels. Uh, that is against the word of God. You as a parent have a right to get up in the face of an educator and say, oh, no, that is not right. Uh, my child will not be subjected to that kind of teaching. But what do we do? Well, we just send them off to school, hope for the best. Yeah, you just hope for the best, you're going to get the worst. Because Susie's going to come home and say, hey, my teacher identifies as... You fill in the blank. I've got a friend of mine... They got so tired of this, he ran for school board. He's going to be on the school board. Let me tell you something. You you can make a difference in this world around you if you simply get up on your feet and stand for what you believe is right. Amen. Being taught a woke agenda that confuses the heart of our children. What's amazing is that when we do speak out, the media cries out claiming separation of church and state, separation of church and state. Let me tell you something. There is no separation of church and state. The state was built on the church. We are one together. And what they are simply telling you is you don't have the right to speak about public policy and law, but all the while they will march down Main Street and declare their policy about what they believe. They don't, they're not ashamed to proclaim their woke agenda. My God, the Bible said, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Jesus Christ. If they're not ashamed to proclaim, amen, their leftist agenda that is going to destroy our country, why are we sticking around and not declaring the truth of the word of God to to our children, and to our nation. Come on, somebody. They want us to cower in the church and lock ourselves in a little stained glass prison and stay there. And that's exactly what the devil wants. Salt salt shackled in the sanctuary and light, light locked down in the church house. The last time I checked, Christians are not second-class citizens. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's good, it's, it's good for nothing. Cast it out. Trod, trod it under, walk all over it. Trod it under the foot of men. He said, you're a light of the world. The city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Listen, we've got to stand up. I said, we've got to, you, you, you've got to stand, I've got to stand up. There's so much that is going on right now. Kids being taught critical race theory, putting one against another. Now I'm just going to be vulnerable with you. I like Toy Story. You like those movies? Until the last one came out. Buzz Lightyear, come on. Who doesn't like Buzz Lightyear? Was check was checking it out. I did. Was checking it out to take, take my family to watch it. Found out he's being raised by two lesbians. 
And that is a movie that is being put in the heads. And I know you say, Pastor, you shouldn't be talking about that behind the pulpit. Let me tell you something. The reason I'm talking about it is behind the pulpit is because you and I aren't talking about it in our homes. And if I don't say it, nobody's going to say it. And your child's going to go to the movie and think it's okay to be raised by two women or two men as partners because that's the culture. Let me tell you something. That may be the culture, but it's not the truth of the word of God. And you need to pull your bucks out of the theater pull your money out of the theater and say, we're not going. And here's why. Here's why. This is why. And set your child down and say, this is what we believe God has for marriage. And they are not promoting what God says about marriage. But I want you to know what God says about marriage. And quit shrugging your shoulders and acting like there's nothing that you can do. Brother, there is something that you can do because money talks. Disney has become a leading voice. And we need to understand that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Y'all hear what I'm saying today? And parents, I love you. That's why we've got such a great next-gen ministry for your kids because we don't want them swallowed up in the black hole of this culture. And they will be swallowed up. They will be swallowed up. Get on your knees. And I got to close. Get on your knees. Get on your feet. Walk into the classroom. Ask your child's teacher what's being taught in the classroom. Ask for a copy of the curriculum. Ask Johnny when he comes home what he learned today in school. Don't you dare let him sit at the table with his iPhone while he eats his broccoli. Put the phones away and have supper together as a family. I said, Mom, you, Dad, you put the phones away too and have supper as a family. Talk to your kids about what they learned in school. Get on your feet. Write your congressman. Let them hear what you believe. Say, oh, Pastor, they don't really say, yeah, they do. They know what, they, well, they know what a vote means. Which leads me to this last one. I have hope in America because of who we are, because we will get on our knees, we will get on our feet, and we will let our voice be heard. Now, don't lose out with me on this one. But the Bible said, Exodus 18 and 21, you will provide out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. God is establishing that government and leadership is chosen. In our country, voting is a simple act with a significant impact. And when we vote, we determine who leads our nation, makes our laws, and protects our freedom. Now, I'm going to quote Samuel Adams here. He said, let each citizen remember at the moment he is offering his vote that he is executing one of the most solemn trusts in human society for which he is accountable to God and his country. Now, I know it's going to get quiet on me, but I'm going to tell you anyway. We have an obligation to vote according to God's law and not according to political platform. Let me say it again. You, you, I am going to stand before God about how I voted. Did I vote according to what God said in his word or did I vote according to what Aunt Millie said our family has always voted for?
Brother, I'm going to answer. To, come on, church. Uh, amen. Don't fall out with me on this uh, because I know some people, I just don't want to vote. Let me tell you something. You don't vote. It's as if you are voted in the opposite direction of what God wants. Uh, you have a voice. It is the voice of God. And I believe that we need to stand, go to the booth uh, and vote for life, vote for marriage, vote for family, vote for freedom and anybody or anything that opposes, uh, amen, a traditional biblical definition of marriage, life, and freedom does not get my vote. An old proverb still stands true today. Bad politicians are elected by good people who don't vote. Proverbs 29 and 2, the Bible said, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. When you don't vote, you've got no right to complain. And I'll just be honest, there is no defense for voter, ap voter apathy, especially among believers. Because we have been commanded by Jesus to penetrate our culture. We are not to stand on the sidelines. You know why our country's in the mess it is? It's because we, we think that we don't have, we just kind of stand on the sidelines and go through the motions of worship and we do what we do. No, we are the, we are the light and the salt of this world. Come on, church. We've been called to penetrate this, this culture. And you don't vote just for the sake of voting. You vote for your value. You don't vote according to convenience. You vote according to conviction. You don't vote party, you vote principle. And church, I believe that today, my goal, my mission, my assignment has been to send a wake up call to the body of Christ that we have got to know where we come from. Thank God for our freedom, but we gotta know who we are. We are an ambassador who gets on our knees and then stands on our feet and lets our voice be heard. And if everybody, let me tell you something. I, I love that story of Elisha and his servant. When Elisha looked around and said, oh man, look, we're all surrounded by the Syrians. Oh, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible. Elisha said, God opened his eyes. His eyes were open. And he saw angelic flaming armies. Let me tell you something, church. Oh, how do you don't hear what I'm saying right now? Amen. I said, we got the angelic armies that are fighting uh, on behalf of the body of Christ. Uh, and when men and women of God get on their face before God and begin to cry out, God dispatches uh, an angelic army upon this nation uh, and is going to fight a battle that you can't fight, uh, but he will fight it for you. Somebody shout amen. I believe the spirit of God will get in, 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 in our Congress in our Supreme Court, in our courthouses, in our sheriff's offices. You may not be able to physically walk in there, but the Spirit of God can. And if you will pray that way, He will do it. But we've got to get serious. So I pray that what I have said, you were able to receive from a heart that means what I say. I love my God. And I love our country. And I want to I wanna be free. I want to be free. And I, I, I believe America has a prophetic role to play in these last days. I believe we have a role to play in our support of the nation of Israel. And we, I believe, will be the only country that comes to stand in the gap for Israel. When everybody else has turned against the Jewish people, I believe the United States has been chosen by God to stand with her. So church, I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop talking. And I'm not going to stop believing because I have hope in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Glory to God. Glory to God. Stand to your feet as the ushers are coming to serve you communion today. This is the first Sunday of the month and I feel it's fitting that it is the day before Independence Day. 
It was the blood of men and women that was shed throughout the last 246 years that had preserved our freedom. Some of you have lost family members, maybe spouses, sons, daughters, grandfathers, in the hell of war. But they gave their lives so that we could have the freedom to do what we do today. And I know I didn't touch it, but I'll go ahead and say it. If we don't stop, if we don't start standing for our freedom, even this freedom of gathering, assembling, and worshiping God will soon be taken if we don't stand up for it. And that's why we've got today to believe God. Because the bloodshed of men and women have preserved our national freedom, but it was the blood of our Savior. One man, one Lamb of God that has established our eternal freedom of righteousness and salvation.